All right, good evening, everybody. Hope you are all doing well. Tonight is our last night before we get a two day break. I bet you everybody's ecstatic for that. I know I am. So uh, we're going to get through chapter five tonight. I tried to get Miss Davenport to, to teach tonight, but she told me no. So I'm hoping maybe, maybe Miss Lila would love to teach tonight. So that's what I'm hoping. Now if I teach, everybody get A's and they off. <laughs> I like that idea. <laughs> I'm back. I second it. I second the motion. It carries. Oh goodness, y'all. <laughs> Tonight we're gonna we're gonna try to make it quick. We're gonna try to make it quick, y'all. Promise y'all. We're gonna try to get through it as quickly and as painlessly as possible. So, all right. So this evening. We're going to be speaking or talking about buyer agency. So yesterday we talked about seller agency. Today we're talking about the other side when you're representing buyers. So again, in this particular situation, can you reach that one for us if you don't mind? Thank you, ma'am. Perfect. Oh, I want to move. There we go. I don't know why the sun is so bright today. Perfect. That works perfect right there. So in that situation, what we're going to talk about, as you can see, there's a lot on this slide, a ton. Uh, so we're going to end up going through these different elements, buyer representation agreement, uh, deciding when to represent the buyer, the creation of the agency, uh, the benefits of buyer agency relationships, written uh, notifications, um, buyer broker disclosures. We're going to do a lot tonight. Okay, that's why that's why I was hoping that either Miss Davenport or Lila would take it and I could go home. But what about us? huh? What about no, us? Do you well, you know what, Cody? We will let you teach tonight. There's there's well, not much up here. Yeah, you're an intern. Come on up here. You teach, and I'm gonna go home. <laughs> exactly. So we do have a lot that we're gonna get into. Um, you know, I should have had Enrique teach because he just graduated, so he would have been a great teacher on this material. So maybe the next class, Enrique, I'll let you have it, sir. Uh, <laughs> I've been at my, my computer for six hours doing all of the quizzes and the final and everything. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> But we're gonna we're gonna get going and we're gonna get this done. So again, like I said yesterday, when you technically the person that everybody watches is the seller. Okay, everything encompasses the seller. Okay. But if a person decides, like we said before, if pick on Cody today, if Cody decides that he does not want or if he wants to be represented. And he wants another person to represent him he has all rights to do that he can hire me to come in and represent him and end up in that situation he would sign a buyer representation agreement okay now when he does that i'm i'm le legally responsible to cody at that point so mr eugene if you're representing miss davenport and she's the seller and like i said if i did not have an agreement with cody then my duty is to tell you everything Cody tells me. But when Mr. Cody signs that form, it's like a shield mm -hmm. that now says, I can no longer share what Cody's telling me. Okay? So it identifies the rights and obligations of the broker and the buyer. So it's going to tell you, Cody, what I expect out of you and what you can expect out of me. Okay? So it dictates what the terms are going to be. Okay? Now, as you can see here, this is a sample by a rep. Now they change these all the time, guys and gals. But what happens is, as you can see, the very top coding would be me and your information, okay? And the key thing here, if you're taking notes, is this second part right here, that broker, is not your name. It's not going to, if, if you're representing a person, if Stefan uh, was representing you, you're not gonna put, by a broker, Stefan Grossman. Because Stefan's not what, Cody? He's not a broker. And since he's not a broker, he can't go here. Now, what if Stefan was a broker, but he worked under my brokerage? 
Could he put his name on there now? Put in the new He still has to put whose name? Mine. Not my personal name, but the company name. Okay. So we're going to put in this hypothetical, Cody, you are simply a, the buyer. So we put your name at the top, my company here in the second part, and then it starts talking about appointment, meaning that the client grants to the broker the exclusive right to act as the client's real estate agent for the purpose of acquiring property in the market area. Okay, that's number one. Then you talk about definitions. You have your term, which is extremely important. Had people before that have left this out, left this blank. Go to the other that blank. I'll get to that later. You cannot sign this contract if there are blanks. I'm going to say that again. You cannot, this contract is not enforceable if there are blanks. Okay? Because of the fact of the matter is, if this is left blank, if why not on four is left blank, that means technically me and Cody, we're still in what? We're negotiating. Me and you still talking about what we're going to do. You see what I'm saying? So in this particular situation, the term has to be fully completed. Okay. So when we're going through these blanks, you need to fill them out or put in a. Okay. Now into the next one, the representation. You need to talk about who's representing. Okay, what the duties are. You need to talk about what's called intermediary status. Very important. Sometimes the client may not want to go into an intermediary. Sometimes they don't want to see your brokerage's listings. They only want to see external listings, not internal. Okay. So in that situation, B would not would be something if your client does not want to deal with your personal listings. Okay. It also talks about the intermediary status, competing brokerages or clients, as well as confidentiality information. They also talk about the brokerage fees and how they're going to be paid. And in a buyer rep, Cody, guess what? If Miss Davenport tells Mr. Eugene that she's only paying the buyer's agent 1% commission, and I put 3% up here in 11A, guess what happens? Who pays the difference in 2%? You. You're the client. You have to pay me the difference that Miss Davenport's not given me. See how that works? So if Miss Davenport finds a property, or you're selling, you find hers and you love her property, and it's 1%, and I have 3% up here in 11A, then you got to pay me 2% up front before we close. Out of your pocket. I like that. Not at all, right? Okay. That is exactly why, Mr. Grossman can tell you, this is exactly why most people will not sign this form. Exactly why. Because Stephan can tell you, in this situation, clients end up, what happens, Stephan, is commissions always 3% 3, 3 across the board. No. No, what can they be? They can be lower. Could they be 1%? Yeah. Could they be 1.5%? So in that situation, Cody, if you sign three here and we find one that's one percent, you got to come up with the money to pay me the difference. See the problem? So most people do what? I don't want to sign this. Well, if you don't want to sign that, okay, Cody, you don't want to sign this contract. Then what that basically means, Cody, is guess what? I can't help you because anything that you tell me. I've got to tell Mr. Eugene in Miss Davenport's case. So it's either you pay and get represented, or you don't pay and you might get screwed. See how there's a problem here. Okay. So I'll tell you how I deal with this in some situations because a lot of times I just like to keep things simple. <clears throat> Cody, you come to me and you say, Justin, I just want to go look at this stuff and talk to you confidential for about a week and then I'll make a decision on what I want to do. Okay. Then Cody, all we'll do. Can you change it? Um, I'll come back here and I'll say, okay, Cody, then let's just put right here in term seven days. There's no requirement that I have to put a year in here. I'll put seven days. I can put one day. 
I'm doing whatever I want in that number. Okay. So again, in this situation is we want to make certain by all means that we are fulfilling our duty. Okay. So in that situation, we got to make certain that we're fulfilling our duties. Okay. That we're fulfilling our obligation. Now, another thing you'll notice through here is they talk about down here in the bottom, in addition to commission specified in 11A, broker is entitled to the following. F1. I've had this happen, guys and gals. Had it happen. Went in, I showed probably this as a friend. It always happens to friends, does it not? And Stephen will say it always happens to Justin's friends, not his, just Justin's. Okay. In this situation is, I had a client, I probably showed him at least probably 60, 70 houses. And we're not talking about just Bryan College Station. We're talking about Houston, Tomball, uh, we went out to Brenham, we went out to Giddings, we went out to uh, Crockett, we've been to Bryan College Station, we even looked at some Houston spots. We went all over, all over. So. After I did all that work, he comes to me and says, my wife and I talked and we're going to build. What? Yeah, my wife and I talked, we're going to build. Uh, what? Yeah, we're, we're going to end up building. I was like, you got to be cracked. I went and did all this stuff for nothing. But there was something I had done by accident. I was still a young, dumb agent at the time, so I was just hungry for some money. And I had put in F1 10%. 10%. I didn't know. My broker ended up said, yeah, that was fine. He just quickly went through it, went and did the deal, went and helped him with the thing. And I'm thinking, I'm only getting 3%. That's all I'm getting. Guess what happened? He closed on the property and everything, and guess what? I got 10% of their purchase price. 10%. It wasn't all for nothing. But there is this little loophole. See, most people, if Mr. Grossman probably didn't know this, or Cody didn't know this, they would probably just left that blank, that little blank blank right there, put, put nothing in there. Well, technically, you leave that blank, you're not entitled to anything, okay? So I put that in there that I wanted 10%. And it basically states that if your client cannot find a house, then you put they, that paid from there. So all I did was I had to submit that buyer rent to the builder. The builder saw the percentage, and they cut me my 10%, okay? And of course, you got to split, at that time, I had to split with my broker. But... Again, that was a, a fluke, but it happened. But it's important that if your client is going to use you to negotiate construction, you better put something in there. Okay? Protection period. Now, this is something I really want everybody to listen to me about. This is, this is where I want everybody's ears perked up. Okay? In real estate, everything works perfect. True or false, Stephanie? Uh, very false. What was that? Very, very false. <laughs> very, you mean it doesn't just go completely A to B with no issues, right? I, I haven't had one yet. <laughs> Man. And I got real estate, Cody, and thought that real estate's just, you just make tons of money like what it does on HGTV. That's how it works, isn't it? You just make tons of money and just do no work? Is that how it works? No, please. <laughs> Here's what happens in this industry. I'm going to be honest with you. You'll meet those people that are sweet and kind. Miss Davenport, she's a sweet, kind lady. But don't you mess with Miss Davenport when it comes to money. Don't you mess with her, Mr. Eugene. When it comes down to money, that's a different story. Okay? And I'm just messing with Miss Davenport. Right. But, but the thing is, is that there are people 
When it comes down to money, Mr. Davenport, is it not true? There are people out there that they will stab you in the back for one dollar. Mm -hmm. Okay? So in this in this industry, Mr. Stephan can tell you that's how it is here. That's how it works. So what happens though is, and it's sad, it's happened to me maybe two or three times over my field. So we're just gonna play this out. Mr. Enrique, okay, he ends up He's representing me. I'm a buyer. He's representing me. He has me under a buyer representation contract. And I find out that my dad is getting his real estate license. And he's going to have his license in the next two months. And my buyer representation with Enrique, guess what? Ends in two months. And so I end up. I go look at a ton of properties and in, and I find the one that I love. I love it. And I go and Cody, it's your property. I go and I look at it. I'm like, man, this is beautiful. I need this house. I want this house. This is it. But I don't tell Enrique nothing. I keep it hush hush because I've been talking to my dad behind the scenes. And he's like, well, just go use Enrique to have him let you in look at it and all. But but just hold off for two months until I you, until I get my license. So Enrique goes and shows me the house, and I, you know, tell him, yeah, I might be interested. You know, just find some more information out for me. And then I make it very difficult for Enrique to get a hope to me. I'm always telling him, hey, I'm going to be out of town next week. Call me the week after. So there's one week done. Then he calls me. Yeah, I had something come up, and a family member happened to get sick, so I can't be out. So give, give me another couple of weeks. I'll, I'll be ready. But to tell that, that agent I'm, I'm interested. So I delay. I delay. And sure enough, I delay right after the two months Mr. or my dad gets his license. So now my buyer rep is about to expire. And Enrique calls me and says, hey, Justin, just want to let you know your buyer rep's about to expire. And I said, you know what, Enrique, thank you for all your time, man. Appreciate everything, but my dad just got his license. I'm going to go use him. Thanks, bro. Appreciate it. Oh, by the way, we're best friends still, right? Uh huh. Okay. Enrique's probably showed me 50 houses. I wait until my dad gets the license, and then I end up, yeah, we're still good buddies, right, Enrique? Yeah, man, we're still buddies, but I'm going to go use my dad. You're not going to get any money, but I'm going to use my dad. Okay. Well, if Enrique put, say, 60 days in this box G down here, protection period, if he showed me that property and I get it under contract and close on it within that 60-day period, guess what happens? He's still entitled to his commission. You would get your commission, and I got to come out of pocket to pay Enrique because the fact is I ended up with basically back stabbing, you could say, and trying to only pay my family or my friends. So in that situation is the protection period protects the or the agent from the client pulling a fast one. And I want to tell you, agents do it every day. I can't tell you how many times I'm in these classes teaching these classes. And I'll have a student raise my hand or raise their hand and go, Mr. Nobles, Mr. Nobles. Yeah, what, what's up? Hey, so I'm fixing to finish my courses here and you know in about three months. And uh, my mom or my dad's about to buy some property. And uh, so I ended up, I told my mom and dad not to just to, to hold off and, and wait for me. I ended up, I told them just wait for me. And I'm like, no, you don't do that. Well, I, I've already, the, the other agent, Miss Davenport, she's experienced and all, so she knows all the stuff. But once it's all done, then I'm going to go over there and just tell them to pull away from Miss Davenport and use me. So she's done all the work, and I'm going to get the paycheck. That's not how this works. That's not how it works. But the sad thing is, Stefan, does it sometimes work? Yes. Yes, it does. They look savage. Yes, they are. They're very savage. <laughs> they will find a way to come in and undercut you to the best of their ability. And it's sad. It is. But I want you to know, in this field, be prepared for it. 
you don't ever let your client out of your sight. You give your client even like maybe 12 hours and they're already Googling and searching and all on something else. Today I went down and I went and got a car. And while I was there, I had ended up, uh, real life actually, Mr. Evanport, I've been talking to this one lady for about three months. Three months I've been talking to this lady, figuring stuff out. I go in to pick it up and this other lady cuts in line to get to, to steal it from her. Yeah. People are savage. People will end up, they will stab you in the back just to make that money. Okay? So I'm just going to tell you, you want to put this protection period in here because it protects you to make sure you're owed your money. However, let me ask you this question, Cody. What if you ended up, you're representing Miss Leela, and Miss Leela pulls a fast one on you, and she buys the house you showed her within that 60-day period, can you go after Miss Leela under the protection period? What did you say, within the 60 days? Uh-huh, it's within the 60 days. Yeah. No, because you're a real estate agent. The only person that can enforce this agreement is who? Your broker. Your broker. So you have to come to, say you work for me, you got to come to me and you got to ask me, Justin, will you go after Miss Leela to get my money? You yourself can't go after her. You see how that works. So you have to ask me to end up going after Miss Leela, but I may tell you, I don't want to do it. Miss Leela ends up, she's got a lot of clientele. She knows a lot of people around town. The worst thing I could do is sue Miss Leela in court over a $3,000 commission. It'll probably do $70,000 of damage to me. So I'm not going to do it. Is there anything you can do? Nothing. See, when brokers are put to this point, we sometimes have to look. Number one, does the client first, do they have any money? That's the first question. Number two, what if they are a high-profile client? They're a high-profile client. They probably have a lot of friends. And if they have a lot of friends, what are they going to go do? They're going to go blab it. Can you believe Cody's suing me? Can you believe Noble's Realty is suing me? And then it gets all over town, and then they get on the news and all this. And what happens to that entire brokerage? Bankrupt over $3,000. See the problem. So there's a lot of things that comes into place. Devin will always tell you, Justin, I don't know how you do it. I don't want your job. He says, the stress you go through on a daily basis, I don't want your job. It's the truth. I got I to gotta weigh a lot of options. Because your $3,000, if I go sue them, may kill everybody else in my firm, and they go homeless. They have no money. So I have to weigh risks, pros and cons all the time, okay? Again, you gotta put your county in, any addendums. So you see 16 right there, addenda. Any boxes that you check in addenda must be included with the contract. If you check every one of them, you better have them with that agreement when you go get them signed. I have agents that I have to watch sometimes, they'll check all these boxes, send them off to the client, Mr. Eugene gets them, he signs just this form, sends it back, I get it, or my office manager gets it, we go through it and we're like, uh, Mr. Eugene, where's the rest of these? Oh, I forgot, let me go get them redone. Doesn't work like that. It's gotta all be sent at one time, okay? Again, you also have in this situation the signatures, okay? Now, if you'll notice right here, Ms. Lila, are you on, to, or can you hear me? Yes. Okay, Miss Leela, do you see right here on the left-hand side towards the bottom where it says Brokers Printed Name, and then underneath it you see Brokers Associates? Do you see that? I know it's kind of fuzzy, but can you see that? Yes. Okay. Who do you think can sign, if you're a real estate agent, who do you think can sign that Brokers Associate if you work for me? I would think I could, huh? Yes, ma'am. A salesperson can sign, if you check that second box, Broker's Associate, you could sign your name and date it 
You just have to put at the top where it says broker's printed name, you have to put like with my company, you put Noble's Realty Group, our, our license number, then Miss Leela, you would sign and date and print your name at the bottom and you have now bound me to this contract. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So in that situation, Mr. Eugene, I think, I can't remember if it was you or somebody else had asked, or I think maybe Linda had asked me, well, doesn't the broker need to sign this all the time? Well, it would be nice, but the problem is, is how could I be in Houston signing a document with Miss Leela when Stephan needs me in College Station and Cody needs me in Nacogdoches? All at the same time. Can't do it, okay? That's why when we do our independent contractor agreement, when I sponsor somebody, I'm giving them that power just to bound me to this contract. They are basically a replica of me, okay? So again, very important in this situation that you see these terms here. So the next thing is, and this is where it's very important from y'all's perspective, because remember, if Miss Leela, Mr. Eugene, she signs this form and binds you in it, I've never met you. I don't know who you are, okay? So Miss Leela signs this contract, and next thing you know, you become the most difficult client I've ever had. You've made Miss Leela's life, you know what, made my life, you know what. Okay? You're using 90% of my time and only going to spend $100,000. When I got Miss Davenport, she's representing Stefan, and he's spending $6 million. But I can't spend any time on that deal because I'm focused on you. See the problem here? Uh huh. So in this situation, we have to decide to represent the buyer. We need to know when do we accept a buyer, okay? So agency relationship not required to help find property for a buyer. Miss, uh, let's say Mr. Garrett walks in here today. He comes into my office and he says, I'm looking to buy a house. Okay, come on in, Garrett. Let's look. That's all I need to do. I don't need to go over and have him fill out paperwork. Don't have to. I just show him some houses. It's kind of like think of it this way. When you go into Target or Walmart and you're just walking around, as my mother calls it, window shopping, okay, that's what you're doing. They're just coming in to window shop, okay? You don't have to have a buyer's agency. So buyer-client relationship is not mandatory when dealing with this type of relationship, okay? The significant responsibility is what we're gonna talk about here in a little bit, but the key thing that they're talking about is the avoidance. If Mr. Garrett walks into my property or into my office, <clears throat> says I wanna see some properties, then Mr. Garrett and I can sit down and start looking through it. And of course, I'm gonna show whose property's first. My own. Right. I'm gonna show my firm's listings first. Right. And Garrett says, ooh, I wanna buy that one. And that one is Mr. Jacob's house, or Mr. Jacob's listing, okay? So Mr. Jacob's listing's there and I'm showing it to him and he's all like, I wanna buy that house. And I said, okay. Let's go look at it. And we go look at it. And then he tells me, well, I'm approved for 300, Mr. Jacob's selling it for 300, but I want to offer him 250. Okay, Justin, can you do that? Well, what's the problem there? If I'm a salesperson. What's the problem, Garrett, with that hypothetical? I'm a salesperson, I'm not a broker. What's the problem with that situation, sir? Can you repeat it? Man, Mr. Garrett's sleeping over there on me. <laughs> I'm messing with you, Garrett. I'm saying the fact is, is Garrett, if you end up in this particular situation, okay, you end up, you come in, you want to look at my property, or look at Mr. Jacob's property, and I'm a salesperson. I'm not a broker. I'm just an average real estate agent, and, I, and in our office, Mr. Jacob has a listing that you like, can I go in and represent you in that transaction? Yeah. 
Uh, yes, sir. Yes, you can. Because of the fact of the matter is, is who's representing the self? Mr. Jacob. Mr. Jacob's representing the seller. Garrett just walked in. I showed him some properties. He likes those properties. So guess what? Mr. Garrett is going to end up, he is going to be represented by me, two agents. Thus, the broker is an intermediary, but the person is not being represented by the same individual. Now, if I had a listing and Garrett came in and liked my listing, now I have a problem because I'm a real estate agent with a listing and a buyer in the same situation. I can't do that. There's potential to have dual representation. You gotta be careful. So it may prefer to work with the buyers as simple customers on in-house sales. So if Garrett walked in and he liked my listing, I may just want to tell Garrett, hey, Garrett, you represent yourself. I represent Cody, and we're going to do a transaction. But you're not getting any advice here. Okay? That situation is somewhat okay. But again, your broker needs to confirm that's okay. But you got to be very careful when you're deciding when's the right time that representation is coming into the factor. Okay? Very key here. Now, other factors that you need to consider. Okay? Say, for example, that um, we're going to say in this situation that Enrique comes in. And Enrique walks in. And he wants to look at my property. I may need to also consult not just Trent rules, but I also may need to consult our company's policies. What does the company policy say? Maybe the company policy says that the broker does not allow any representation to that situation. Maybe the broker does not want intermediary status. Maybe there's a certain rule. You have to watch your company's policies. You also have to watch when a broker, the broker, that's me, is the agent of a buyer. It's a big, big issue. That's why one of the positive guys and gals, a lot of people don't think about this when they're talking to brokers. But here's one of those situations. If I'm representing a buyer, Y'all have listings. Whose listings are they? They're mine. Even though I've never met y'all or those people, they're my listings. And I'm representing a deal. Guess what? We got a problem here. Okay? Because a broker can never go up against his agent. I'm going to say that again. A broker can never go up against his or her agents. However, it is imperative that when you're dealing with this and you're looking at brokers, you need to ask your brokers, are you a competing broker? There are plenty of brokers that are out there that compete with their own agents. You gotta watch it. Because if your broker, say Miss Davenport, Mr. Eugene, is sponsoring you, she's a broker, you're an agent. Well, guess what? She's out there, she may tell you, okay, Mr. Eugene, you gotta put all your clients' information in my database, my brokerage database. Well, guess what Ms. Davenport could do? She'd go in that database and do what? Contact every one of your clients and try to steal them from you. There are brokers in the world that do that. See, that's why I do keep a database, but I'm what's called a non-competing broker. Because when a broker competes against their agents, it's just like what we talked about last night. Imagine the football coach and the team all competing against each other against another team. How would that work? How would Mr. Mr. Cody, you're into fitness. Imagine your coach, your fitness coach, competing against you. You think he's going to give you good advice? They're going to the same event, to in the same category, the weight category, and all same everything. Your coach is competing against you for a hundred thousand dollars. Is he going to want you to be in peak, peak physique shape if he's trying to win that, that same prize that you are? Probably not. Probably not. 
you would know better, but again, probably not. It's the same thing here. You have to understand in these situations that you got to watch out when your broker represents people because there could be that accidental dual agency. Okay. Sometimes you got to watch your contracts when you're signing your uh, independent contractor agreement. Sad to say this, really sad. See, when you go in, and, and I, I hate when I see this with students, I hate seeing this all the time. Because students, when they go, they go to a brokerage to get interviewed, and guess what they do? They go into Miss Davenport, and they walk in, and they say, Hi, Miss Davenport, my name's Justin, and I just got my real estate license. I want to work for you, Miss Davenport. And Miss Davenport's telling me about how I'm going to be a millionaire in, in 12 months, and I'm going to make all this money, and I can retire, and all this stuff. But she wants, to, wants me to sign with her, and how wonderful her trainings are. Okay? But the thing is, is what Ms. Davenport hides is in her contract, it's kind of down towards the bottom, that whatever agents, or not agents, whatever clients I drum up, so if I drum up a bunch of clients and I leave Ms. Davenport's firm, guess where those clients stay? They stay with Ms. Davenport. She's the broker. She gets to take all her clients. So she stole, I went and drummed all the business up for you, Ms. Davenport. And I did all the work, and she gets to keep them. Okay? So you got to be very careful with these contracts. You have to be very careful. I've had agents that come and go. It happens. It, I, like I tell people all the time, I don't care if you come or go with me. I really don't. Because the fact is, I'd rather have good rapport and still go to lunch. I go to lunch with people that aren't in my firm sometimes once a week. They'll be a Kelly Williams, 621, rematch. I'll go to you with them. I don't care. I really don't. I'd rather have a good working relationship than have a, I hate you, you hate me. Because that means when we have a transaction, that transaction is going to go south. Okay? So, when we're going through this situation, we have to make certain that you're reviewing these things. How are your clients going to stay? You may be leaving a brokerage. And if you're leaving a brokerage, I may not want to put them under a buyer rep. Because the fact is, is that if I switch brokers and I put them under buyer rep, it's going to stay with Ms. Davenport. So I may want to hold off. Okay. May prefer to treat a, or treat as customers in-house. May end up anybody that comes in and just wants to look at properties. May want to just treat them as customers. Don't treat them as a client. Treat them as a customer. Again, exclusive buyer agency may avoid problems though. There was one thing that was brought to my attention. Uh, one of my agents, he went to a class, and I always, it, it always encouraged my people to go through trainings. And he went through this one class, and he said the instructor had, he doesn't have an option. Every time he shows a house, he has buyer rep, period, before he'll even show the house. Period. Buyer rep. And he went to show this one house that was a one or two million dollar house. Went out there to show it. The guy pulls up in his brand new Mercedes Benz S Class, over a hundred thousand dollar car. Pulls up. The agent pulls up too. They go in and walk the house. Of course, he had his buyer rip. They were leaving the house, and the house gate that they had, because the house had a gate around it, the gate malfunctioned and slammed into that guy's car. That house, that gate, slammed in to that car. Thankfully, he had a buyer representation. That buyer representation in there states that you are released of any liability. So, Aiden, if you had gone out there and that happened, guess what? It's on me. No, no, no. If you had that form, oh, yeah. it's gone. You're not nobody's liable. He's yeah. on his own. But had you not yeah. had that buyer rep, who's it on? It's going on you, and it's going on me, okay? So it's imperative that you have to make certain that sometimes a buyer agency can be very useful and beneficial, okay? The broker also may appoint the sub-agent to find properties. I do that all the time. Client calls, and I appoint them. I say, hey, Aiden, 
Ms. Davenport just walked in. Ms. Davenport, you're going to be working with Aiden. Aiden, you're going to help her find properties. Make an appointment. Okay. Very important that you know those. Now, how do we create agencies? Well, there's your messages right there. It can end up being expressed. I just walk up to you, Ms. Davenport, say, here's a form. Here's representation. Can you fill this out? Thank you, ma'am. She filled it out. It's, it's expressed. She's told me she wants me to be her agent. Okay. It's also in written. They're in written form. It works. But here's the problem. That one right there. Miss Linda, you worked in the school district before. <laughs> What happens a lot when, in the school district when there's a fight between, say, two girls? They're fighting over eight. There's two girls fighting over him. And they both yank each other's hairs, okay? And they're hitting and all this. And you go over there and you say, all right, all right, break it up, break it up. Who started it? What do they say? I don't. She did. <laughs> yeah. Well, do you know who actually started it? No, it's her word against her word. Okay? That happens a lot, by the way. So, Aiden, we need to talk about that. See, too many women fight over you, so. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> but what ends up happening in this situation, guys and gals, is that, yes, you got to watch this oral part. Because clients can easily come up and say, hey, Mr. Eugene, you're doing a great job. I want you to be my agent, okay? Cool, okay, okay, we're both good, okay. That was good. Mr. Eugene's my agent. Guess what? He ends up, does that, we say it okay, okay, but when it comes to a court of law and something goes wrong, what happens? I never said I owed him any money. He must have been drinking something. He needs to go talk to Leela for some counseling. Hey, he needs to get some help, right? Because the fact is that it's in writing. Okay? Or not in writing, it's in oral. Now, if you're pursuing a commission, that's the big one. If I'm wanting to get money, this is Trek rules. I want commission, it's got to be in writing. If you want money, it's got to be in writing. Did you hear that, Aiden? Mm -hmm. So in listings, it's easy because you got to get one. But in a buyer rep, truthfully, is it in writing? No. Now, if you're over there showing Cody some properties, you're just showing him a ton of properties and all, and then you put an application and all, and if they actually came back and said, where's your representation agreement, you got it. So truthfully, they can say what to you? You know, you know, I don't owe you a dime. You're supposed to have them in writing. Okay. So what about this representation? Well, when you are representing somebody, in this particular situation, if Mr. Jacob is representing an individual, okay, Mr. Jacob has to provide these services. This is his duty. Okay, he has to create a clear profile of the buyer's needs or wants. This happens a lot. Thankfully, Mr. Jacob's not like this. Mr. Jacob's a great guy. He knows his stuff. But there's a lot of new agents. This is what they do. Here we go. Hi, my name's Justin. Nice to meet you. You got cooties? No, but just making sure. Okay, I don't, I don't like, I don't like uh, COVID, so I gotta watch you from now. On. Now, what do you want? Uh, you want to get houses? Yes. Okay, sounds good. I'm gonna go send you some. Select all, send two thousand. Okay, I sent them to you. I'm gonna go look at them. All of them. Yeah, then he's gonna <laughs> respond back. I wanna see them all. I wanna see every one of them not how this works because I promise you Mr. Grossman if you do something like that what happens to your client what are they going to say if you send if I send him 2,000 listings how many you probably want to go see probably all of them every one of them 
hey, Justin, let's mark out your entire week and just go look at listings for me that I probably won't buy and can't afford, but I'm going to go still look at a week. It'll take like two months to go. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, is that, no, you got to get a clear. Mr. Jacob would come to you and say, hello, Mr. Uh, Mr. Aiden. I am Mr. Jacob, and I ended up, I'm representing you. Could you tell me exactly what you're looking for, sir? I need square footage, bedroom, location, you're needing school district. I need you to tell me exactly what you're looking for so I can narrow down the search to find what you need, sir. That's what Mr. Jacob would do. Because the fact is, he knows. He knows. That's a professional. Okay. A newbie who happens to just get real don't get their MLS. Go selects everything and sends it out. And then they're stuck showing houses that that person can't even afford. Okay? You gotta get a clear profile of what their needs are. And let me tell you, that comes into that next thing. You gotta be actively listening. Do not ever do this, guys and gals. Okay, so Mr. Eugene, uh, how many bedrooms did you want? 13. Okay, you want it four? Are you sure you want four? 13. Oh, oh, 13? Okay, 13. Are you sure 13? How about 16? No, 13. How about I range it from 13 to 50? Uh, well, okay. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Yeah. That's the point that I have mine. <laughs> but the thing is, in that situation, is you got to make certain that you listen actively. For example, listening actively sometimes even means watching with your eyes. Okay? If I walk in and I'm sitting down, or let's use let's use Stefan here. If Stefan walks in and he sits down with you, Mr. Eugene and Miss Linda, he walks in, sits down, and he notices that you got a baby bump. And there's two of you. How many bedrooms, Stefan, should you immediately assume that they they are needing? Three or not? Why three? There's two of them. She got a baby in there. She got a baby. You know, Justin, you better be careful. Because that baby bun may not be a baby. <laughs> Watch out for that. <laughs> Watch out for that. <laughs> I need that plexiglass here right now, Miss Leland. I need some protection. <laughs> that ain't going to help you. Yeah. <laughs> if you notice, y'all, that's why I have a podium here. So, you know, if I need to use it, I got it here. So. <laughs> yeah, they don't stop me. <laughs> but in the situation is yeah you gotta look you gotta notice your clients you gotta notice but leland made a good point there you better not just assume somebody has a baby because let me tell you cody what happens if you walk up to a woman and you're like oh you're expecting a kid and they're not expecting a kid what are they gonna do to you what exactly they're gonna knock you across the head if not that, you can get out that door. Yeah. Lost my... Exactly. <laughs> you lost me, though, boy. You don't ever just assume, but in your mind, like with Stefan, if Stefan saw that, Stefan could simply say, now may I ask how many bedrooms? Are you looking like three to four? Oh, you're wanting five. Okay, perfect. We'll get you five. But don't ever just say, congratulations, you're pregnant. Okay? You don't know that. Okay? You got to be very careful. You also got to advise your clients of market values. I do that all the time. There are some agents that'll get a listing. <laughs> His eyes just got big. I really agree with Aiden. Sometimes market values don't work. <laughs> and it did not work tonight. So let me say this with market values, because I was getting there. With market value, Satan, yes, you can show them everything. And you can break it down and run it all out to them. And they can tell you blatantly, you don't know what the hell you're doing. Do I'm just saying, they will. And you can show it to them black and white. Okay? But the thing is, is that market values. They're going to find out. Unless you're stepping and have some miracle power over here to get people to buy our property that's way through the roof, 
Am I not right? Oh, I didn't do it. <laughs> yeah, you did. Right. I think but you might have one more. The key together. thing, the key thing is though here, is that you have to understand that your clients are not always going to trust you. Guys, I'll be real honest with you. I sat down with a client one time that was wanting to buy some land, and I ran all the stuff, and I was like, they're not going to accept anything over 220. I mean, under 220. They're not going to accept anything under 220. And my client was like, just send them an offer for 180. Let's just see what they do. I said, I'm going to draft an entire offer up for 180. That takes some time. Yeah, I want you to put an offer in for 180. I'm thinking, I'm going to do all this work for nothing. Write it all up, send it to them. They signed it. I called the other agent. And I said, hey, Miss Leela, I'm sorry. I'm about to send you an offer that I know for a fact is going to get knocked down. Coming over now. I was going to let you know. She called me back. She said, Justin, you don't know what just happened. She said, my clients ended up lost their job, and they got to have the money so they'll accept your offer. The market values did not justify that price. But they were desperate, so they would accept anything at all. You never know. But it, after that happened, I finally was like, screw it, real estate, you just do what you can and just see what happens. Okay? I've had clients that have come in and said, just take, it's like taking spaghetti and just throw it at the wall and see what, sta what stands up there. Now, am I saying not to ever stay with market values? No. No. So I'm going to explain something to you. Aiden, when your client ends up tonight, she ended up basically telling you that you don't know what you're talking about, the market values are wrong. Yep. That's fine. Put it on the market. <laughs> Put it on the market. What's every other real estate agent have access to? The MLS. They have access to it. They know what it's worth. After she or he gets four or five offers, What's going to happen at low ball offers where it's supposed to be? What are they going to finally start to figure out? It's not worth. It's not worth money. what they're saying. And that house is going to do what? Sit on the market. It's going to sit. And after six months to a year, what's going to happen? Drop the price. They'll drop that price. But what do you do while you got it on the market? Market. You market that sucker, and you generate the leads. If those leads don't want to buy hers, you go. Take them and find something else. Give you a little tip here. This happens unfortunately too many times in different brokerages. Mr. Enrique calls you, Mr. Aiden, and says, Hey, how much is that property you got listed for? Oh, we're offering 300000 Huh, you lost your mind. Yeah, I know. Click. <laughs> is that right? Is that how you do this? No, what should you do? Is there anything else that you have to look at? Not just that, you should say, Enrique, I understand. My, I understand where you're coming from, but my client is asking 300000 If this is not the property for you, is there another property I can help you find? I'd be more than glad to do a quick search for you real quick. What did you just do? Had another client. You converted them. You don't ever put down your own listing, ever. Agents will call you, people will call you and be like, have you lost your ever? You know what in mind? My response is, sir, madam, my job's to my client. I've advised my client. I've done everything I can. My client has told me a price. That's the price. Sorry, that's all I can do. I can advise a client all day long. But if a client has a number stuck in their head, it's <clears throat> Linda. Um, <laughs> No lie, y'all. I say that for a minute. I was joking there. <laughs> Miss Linda ended up the market value set on their house to rent. No joke with you, Miss Davenport, or anybody. The numbers for rent in Navasota for their house was $1,000 a month. And I told Miss Linda, I said, all the numbers justify $1,000. Even it was only three months ago there was one, y'all. Same square footage for $1,000 a month. That's all you're getting, Miss Linda. What'd you tell me, Miss Linda? Ain't gonna happen. No, what'd you tell me? 
I want it listed for $1,500. No ifs, ands, buts about it. I said, Miss Linda, you lost your ever loving mind. Right. I said, it ain't going to happen. It ain't going to happen. Well, the market values don't justify it. Right. And she said, what? Go out there and put a sign up. Yep. I went on out here looking stupid, put a sign up, walked back in the house. No joke. This is real serious. I walked back in the house. Yep. And I got a phone call. Yep. Lady down the street saw it. Said, how much are you uh, renting the property for? I said, I, I was about to be embarrassed. It's $1,500. Because, by the way, in College Station at that time, $1,500 was like real nice properties. And I'm over here looking at like a 1970s, 80s house. 63. 63. 63 house. And I was like, this, I'm going to look so stupid. I told the lady fifteen hundred. She's like, "When can I come down and see it?" I said, "Well, just I'm here. Come on down." She came on down, walked around. Okay, what do I, what's the process to get it? Uh, fill out the application. Okay, uh, can I go in and put the security deposit down? What? Yeah, we want to move in at the end of August. Uh, 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 I, I'll go. I'll go sign. Start drafting the thing up. Drafted it up. She got her fifteen hundred. She wanted. Yes. It was rented way back. And then so. But then here's something else. So while this is going, yes, Miss Linda. But didn't she say? Are you sure it's fifteen? Wasn't it eighteen hundred? No, she asked me later if we were going to raise it to eighteen. Oh, okay. Yeah. But she ended up. But before all of this. What had happened was my parents saw a house that was on the market for two hundred and something thousand dollars, two ten, two twenty, 220, something like that. My dad sends me this, says, I want to see this house. I said, okay. And I texted him back. I was like, are you being serious or are you joking with me? He said, no, I'm serious. I want to go see it. So I go get the lockbox. I go in. I show the property to him. My mom and dad says, put an offer in at 170 I was like, <laughs> Do y'all not understand we're in a peak market? It is a seller's market. They're not going to drop nearly $50,000. It's just not going to happen. Put it in. I'm like, Jesus, she's making me do all this work for nothing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Drafted it all up, sent it in. Agent calls me back, says, 175 as is. What? You accept 175 as is on this $220,000 home? Yeah. I said, at that point, I was like, you know what? Real estate, you never know what's going to happen. You never know. Right, Stephen? Do things ever end up working how we want them? Nope. So you can have a the market value and whatever. And you never know because here's the thing. If Miss Davenport, maybe she wants to get out of town. Maybe she wants a quiet area. She may want to go over to that place you got, and it's listed for three hundred thousand, and she has three hundred thousand dollars, and she just wants to blow. She come out there three hundred thousand cash, give it to you. Oh yeah. <laughs> You got three hundred thousand cash. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a joke. Miss <laughs> Leela always has told me, and, and Enrique always told me that they wanted to come uh, come move into to that area. So they'll they'll be more than glad to get out of the, the hustle and bustle of the city and, and come down there. So eight, you got two more up there. Come on down. <laughs> no thank you. Live you. where now? Where is it? It's, it's it. Tell them where it's at. Snook. Oh. oh hell no. <laughs> <laughs> what did you just say? Oh, oh, no, just no. said, oh hell no. <laughs> 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 no I guess I'm have to go with Enrique on this then. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you better hurry because Enrique really does sound like he's interested. Yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but no, in this situation, yeah, she gotta look at the market values. Uh, again, financing assistance. You got to help your clients end up getting loans. 
That's this is the one actually number three where most of the problem is. After a contract's in and it's accepted, they people just for some reason it's just habit. People forget about the lender. So they get the contract done, you get receipt it, title has it, everybody's got it except the lender. So here's a lender sitting over here, and 10 days have gone by an option period, and they've gone and done inspections and all. Everybody's happy. Woohoo! Got it all done. You do. Well, let me call, call up the lender and see how things are going. Hey, Mr. Lender or Miss Lender, how are things going? Well, we're waiting on you to get us a contract. What? Oh, crap. I forgot all about that. I need to get that over there. Yeah, you probably should. And you just killed 10 days, which means you probably now are not going to close on time. So in that situation, is you've got to keep the, the people on top of things. And that means even calling the lender, just checking in. Okay? you got to check in. Structure of the offer. You have to help your clients draft their offers to the best of your ability. You also need to explain the contract documents while advocating for the buyer, negotiating the strategy and advice, and advice to consult with other experts. So the key points in this situation is you need to consider the exclusivity, the termination date, any potentials of conflict in, uh, conflicts of interest, the roles of the agents, and the uh, compensation and fees. All of these are the things that you need to be aware of. You need to be aware of. Now, you also need to understand the exclusive right to purchase. Okay, It provides you, just like the exclusive right to sell, it provides you the control over the transaction for the exclusive right to purchase. So it protects the licensee's investment of time, and it opens the buyer agency that may lead to procuring calls disputes. Because see, if I got a contract with you, Cody, that I'm representing you, and you go out, and I've told you in writing, and you signed that you're using me, and you're going out calling Mr. Eugene and Miss Linda and Miss Leela and Enrique and everybody else asking about their listings. Well, you've created a procuring cause issue. You did, not me. So I'm still getting a paycheck because the fact is you signed a form with me. So if you get into a procuring cause issue, you still owe me 3%. Your, your, as I say, your stupidity ain't my problem, okay? Because when I sit down with a, a client and I'm talking to them about signing a buyer rep, I tell you blatantly, do not, do not get on Zillow, do not get on Realtor.com, do not get on any website. You want to see houses, call me, I'll get them to you. Don't get on it. If you're going to get on it, you email it to me. Don't you call it. Don't happen to just be in the neighborhood driving around and you run into Miss Davenport and she starts talking to you. Don't want to hear it. Okay? You just call me, I handle it. And my favorite one is this one. Well, I was just trying to help you or you're too busy. I'm never too busy for money. I'm never too busy for money. And if I'm busy, I got 25 people I can get you to. And Aiden, are you ever too busy for money? Yes, sir. Stephanie, you ever too busy for money? No. No. So, Cody, that's a poor excuse. Okay? So, in that situation is, what, Miss Linda? Nothing. In that situation yes. is, yes, you always tell your client. Now, Mr. Aiden, could you say the same thing to your clients? Yes. Yeah, because guess what? Could you not happen if you're out of town? Could Stephanie not cover for you? Yep. Could I cover for you? Yep. Could any of the other agents in the office cover for you? Yep. Yes, sir. So there's no excuse that your client can't get somebody. Okay. Now, there's also special termination dates. Okay. Or specific, not special, specific termination dates. A termination date is required. I'll say that again. A special termination date is required. Does that make sense? Y'all hear me? It is required for the contract to be valid. 
you cannot put, Miss Linda, if you get a contract, you can't put indefinitely. You can't put 50 years. No. Most courts allow one to two years. Some might argue for best practices one to two years. Why do you want to put such a short time? Well, here's the thing. If you actually are doing your job right and you put your deadlines in it, guess what ends up happening? It allows you every year to make certain that you're doing what, Aiden? You're yeah. keeping in contact with your clients. If I sign a buyer rep with Miss Davenport, she buys a house from me. Guess what? And I keep a buyer rep with her for one year. What's it going to remind me if I put it in my calendar to call Miss Davenport? It's going to remind me to call her and say, hey, Miss Davenport, it's been a while. How you been? Everything going well? I noticed that the buyer uh, buyer representation agreement is terminating. Miss Davenport, how, are you ready to buy another house? No. Well, you know anybody that is? No, not yet. All right, well, will you keep me in mind? Yeah. By the way, could I send you another buyer rep so I can just keep in contact with you? Reminds me. Yeah, Justin, sure. There are my four. That's what you do. Okay. Again, there are certain carryover clauses, like we talked about the protection clause, and they can be rescinded. The contract can be terminated if both parties agree. If Ms. Davenport tells me, you know, in the middle of the contract, Justin, yeah, man, I appreciate everything you've done, but I don't need your services anymore. All right, I understand, Ms. Davenport. Thank you very much for allowing me to help you. We're good. Okay. Key points to consider when you're dealing with these creations. What's going to be the broker's obligation? This is what happens in real life. Y'all ready? Let me see that form for a second. No, I'm over here. Here we go. Okay, this is what happens in real life, everybody. Real life, this is what agents do. And mine do it too, and I have to get on to them. They come out, they have a buyer rep that they just copied verbatim what I've used before. So they just replicate it in one of mine. And then they just go, here, sign here, sign here. Okay, thank you. Okay, here you go, Mr. Broker. Okay, I signed it. I'm good. Well, because I didn't date well, no, but he signed. But here's no, the thing. You no, here's the thing. Day. Here's the thing. <laughs> Stephen, what'd you just say? <laughs> What's this, Aiden? Oh, God. I don't know. I don't know. I just went on zip form and copied what you did. And I and I went over and I went had it done. And then I say, well, Justin, what what's the what's the agreements here? I don't know. I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. What's your deadlines are? I don't know. See a problem there? You bound your broker to an agreement and you don't even know what's going on. You have no idea. You don't even know what the deadline is. That, that contract that your client signed, because by the way, does your clients ever read what they sign? No. No? You put it in there. You owe me a billion dollars. And people would do what? Sign it. It could be in there that you're going to buy my house, Aiden. They sign it. You sign it. Didn't even read it. A lot of my agents I'm starting to see, and not just mine, but many agents. I'll say, what's your contract say on paragraph block? I don't know. You're the agent. You're the one that needs to know it, okay? Because there are certain obligations the broker and the client needs to have. You've got to make certain you're on top of those. There are certain representations that must be had. I come up to you and say, hey, on your listing contract, are we allowed to do intermediaries? No. I don't know. You said no in that one. But I'm saying most people would say, I don't know. I read it. You read it? Oh, yeah. Good job. Good job. Yeah. What about competing clients? What's the policy on your listing that you just got? What's your client tell you about competing clients? I guess oh. I'm ready to get the... Uh-huh. <laughs> uh-huh. Hey, you're one to one. <laughs> uh-huh. 
Miss Leela, they're not listening to me. I'm going to have to send them your way for some counseling. It's about 250, a 30-minute session, right? Yeah, we can do that. Okay. I'm going to start sending y'all that way. It's how much? Yeah, 250. She, she said if you question her charges, it's 500. <laughs> <laughs> You know what? I need to stick with you. I'm about to be rich. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just go up. Miss Linda from now on, they don't read their contracts. They got to schedule a 30 minute session with Miss Lila. So, well, what am I going to get out of it? Miss Lila will give you some money on the side. So. I'm looking at you. Miss Linda going to skim the top. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> But yeah, so you got to make certain that you stay on this. How does your client want you to do these things? What about confidentiality? You notice we talked about your listing, but have I ever said the person's name? Did you ever say the property address? Have I said any of those things? No, because it's confidential. Okay, confidential. I can talk about certain things. Now, here's the key word, though. You cannot, though, talk about stuff that people can automatically assume. So say that I'm representing Mr. Eugene, and I say, oh, Miss Davenport, I have this house. It's listed on Eastshire, and, uh, and you know, it's a, it's a nice such and such, uh, let's say a red house, and uh, it's a beautiful house, and, uh, and it's the only one that's there. What am I doing? Pinpointing. I'm pinpointing. Have I said your name? No. Did I ever say your address? No. But what have I done? Dang good idea. Dang good idea of where your house is, right? Because what happens? That's you've given too much. Okay. You don't end up when you're going through these listings. You do not share confidential information. Keep it hush hush. If, if Mr. Eugene, you I send you an offer, and you call me and you say, Hey, what is really their highest offer they can submit? And I go, You know. You know, they, they probably could do a little higher, Mr. Eugene. And you say, how much higher? Like 10000 No, you can make it a little higher, Mr. Eugene. 50000 Yeah, you a little lower, Mr. Eugene. <laughs> Come on. You see the thing? Uh -huh. Can't do that either. Oh, I actually right. just got asked how low uh -huh. that class would go. And I said, no, but I can't tell you that. That's right. How low is your client going to go? Not your business? Put your offer in, let's see. That's the way you solve that problem. Put that off in. Let's see what the, what the lowest they'll go. Okay. Some of the things that you need to deal with when dealing with conflicts of interest. Conflicts of interest often occur in in-house transactions. Say that again. Most conflicts of interest happen in in-house transactions. Now, the approach that is very key is the lift rope approach. We're going to talk about that in the next class, okay? But it's called last in, first out. We'll talk about that if we get to that point. Brokerages may represent buyers in properties not listed with the broker. Let's say that again. Brokerages may represent buyers in properties not listed with the brokerage. So what that means is people always ask me, do you have any properties? I had one actually today, a lady asked me, she said, you got any properties for under $100,000? First thing I wanted to do was laugh, because good luck finding a property under $100,000. But I told her, I said, no ma'am, I, I don't, but I can probably look on the MLS and find it. She's like, oh, well, you can't do that. And I'm like, yes, ma'am, I can show any property that's on the MLS, even if Miss Davenport is in Brookshire Hathaway, Miss Linda's with Century 21, Mr. Eugene's with Keller Williams. I can still share or show those properties even though I'm not with those brokerages. That's what this is saying. But clients don't know that. Clients think that it's like car selling. You can only go to that dealership and buy their cars. No, in real estate, you can show everybody's listings if it's in the MLS. Okay. You may at some points have to refer a buyer. Sometimes I get leads and I'll show properties here and then they decide, well, I actually want to go and move to Dallas. Do you want to go drive to Dallas, Aiden, for, uh, for 
fifteen hundred dollars? No. No, it's not worth it. Okay. Sometimes you represent buyers and only occasionally take listings from previous buyers. More than one buyer client can be interested in the same property. I had that happen probably two, three months ago. Agent came in, had a buyer that ended up, had one buyer that was interested, and she had two more that wanted the same property. Three buyers, same agent, same property. Is there a conflict of interest? Yeah, if it's not handled right. See, because here's the problem. So we all know Cody's very crooked. We already learned that from here. No, he's not. So, <laughs> <the bias. laughs> so Cody goes over and he's got he's got Miss Linda, he's got Mr. Aiden, and he's got Miss Davenport all want the same property. And so he goes over here and he says, Hey, Cody, guess what? Or hey, hey, guess what? Uh, I got two other buyers that are wanting to buy that same property. You know, it's Stefan's got it listed for 150. You need to put in your highest offer. And so Aiden says, Okay, well, what do you think? What should I put in? And Cody says, 200. Okay, okay, 200. Okay, I'll do 200. Then he goes to, to Miss Linda and says, Hey, Miss Linda, I, I got it. I got somebody in, that's buying it. And he's going to put 200. You should put 210. And so then you say, Okay, 210. Then he goes to Miss Davenport. Hey, Miss Davenport, I got somebody else that's over here. They're going to do 210. What if you put in 220? What's, why is Cody doing that? What's the purpose? Why would he Why would he want to do that? More money, more commission. More money, more commission. That's conflict of interest. It's a crooked way of doing it. Should Cody be representing all three of those people? No. Yes. You heard it back here? You heard it? <laughs> But you got to be careful. See, here's the duty. If Cody was actually doing that, Cody has a duty to tell every one of those people that he has three different interested parties. If he tries to price gouge them and try to get it going up too high, Cody can get in a lot of trouble. Okay? It is in Cody's best interest to inform his broker or his, his or her broker. He needs to let me know. So that I can end up telling him the proper way to handle it. Also, mediation. If there's a dispute, are you going to mediate the problem? Mediation, like we've talked about, and I talked about this before, mediation in real estate happens a lot. Where two people have a dispute, are you going to are you going to resolve the matter between yourselves? Okay. Just a side note, I've already had a few people interested in mediation. There's actually very few mediators in real estate. That's my next training classes that we're going to do after these, is how to become a mediator. Luckily, Ms. Nobles, you don't have to do it. Thank you. She wants to. You're not going to have to. She wants to. But I have a couple of people that are wanting to do mediation. If you want to become a mediator for real estate and you hold your real estate license, you can become a mediator and you can mediate. Mediators sometimes make between $200 to $500 an hour, depending on expertise. Not bad, right, Cody? Okay. So in that situation, mediation is another option. That is, you're trying to help resolve issues. Sometimes there can be the default of contract and remedies for those defaults that need to be stated. How is money going to be broke down? When am I owed a commission? And also special provisions. The advantages of exclusive buyer agencies is that it reduces the risk of undisclosed dual agency. I'll say that again. It reduces the risk of undisclosed dual agency. Okay? Because of the fact is, when you have a signed contract, you are representing who? You're representing that person. Okay? Buyers often see more properties. Okay? Because of the fact is, if they have a contract, what happens? They're going to see more properties because I'm going to get a paycheck. Buyers receive brokers' full loyalty and confidentiality because it's in writing. It also increases the buyer loyalty. It refuses confusion when negotiating, and there are more commission options. Okay. 
The disadvantages with exclusive buyer agency is that conflict with buyer who later wants to sell. There's a problem there, okay? There also can be no dual commissions in these situations. And the conflict if two clients want the same property. Sometimes you can have two contracts. If you do, one of them got to go, okay? Now, when dealing with a single property, you're going to represent the buyer for only one property, okay? And it is a one-time buyer representation agreement, right? One-time buyer representation agreement. The market area is very key here. I tell people this all the time. The market area is going to be limited to the address of the property. So where you're going to see the difference is, is you're not going to put the entire property. You're going to end up putting just that one address. So sometimes you'll have a buyer that says, I want to go look at a property. Okay. And in that situation, you've got to make certain that you are showing only that property and no other ones. It works great when the buyer customer wants to see a FISBO though, because a FISBO is a for sale by owner. And what that is, is if it's a for sale by owner, you're guaranteed a commission because the buyer has to pay for it. Okay. It also secures the licensee's agency status with at least the buyer and the seller is going to or remain the consumer in a FISBO. And they also work well with investors who only occasionally want to see particular properties. Okay. Agency benefits to a buyer tenant. They're often tailored, of course, to the buyer representation contract. They do provide access to a larger market. They do also have stronger negotiating strategies, as well as fiduciary duties to those agents including that confidentiality that we spend a lot of time talking about. There's more counseling and less selling. Okay. There's more counseling. Ms. Leela, that's why I say you're going to be a great agent because you do this part already. I can't tell you how many times I counsel before I actually sell. Already no, I believe it. I've had one today, no lie, that messaged me and said, my marriage is going down the tunnel or down the drain. So I just spent a good hour talking to this person to try to keep them on task. So mm. it happens. You'll have those times that you've got to counsel. You got to listen. I think Stephen had one, an agent told him that uh, she had listened to her client cry for a couple hours. Things happen. Okay. It's what happens in this industry. When dealing with issues to consider, you got to know your earnest money deposit. It's very important. While it's not an essential part of the contract, it's something that you should include. So it does not make the contract valid, but it is important that you have it. It does provide a non-judicial remedy for disputes, and it's an important discussion point to have with the buyer client. Remember, a larger amount looks good in negotiations versus a small amount for risk aversion. Okay? Avoid giving deposits, though, directly to a seller. You go give a, a seller a $10,000 deposit, what's going to happen to that deposit? He's going to go spend it. Don't give it to Miss Linda, she'll spend it. Woo! That look. I don't think <laughs> When appropriate, Ask the seller to deposit sufficient sum to cover the buyer client's cost due to a possible seller default. There are also many other issues to consider, and I'm not going to go through each one of these. There's a lot of them. You read through the buyer agency agreement, the one that's in your book that's online. It lists all of these, but these are just some that you need to consider. 
How are we going to deal with inspections? How are we going to deal with seller financing? What about title issues? What if there's pests in the house? There's a lot of things that you have to consider. Some of the examples of the client and level of service. Put them all up here real quick. These are all going to be some of the examples of the level of service. The price and the appraised value, the seller financing and the earnest money, the condition of the property and any contingencies, fixtures and inventory, research and investigation of that property as well as disclosures, and compensation, especially if there's going to be more than one party that's going to be involved. All of these need to be brought in. But what I don't want you to take from this when it says level of service, this is not saying how much money is Aiden paying me in this transaction and how much is Linda paying me and Eugene. Well, Aiden's paying the most, so I'm going to give him more level of care than Mr. Eugene who's giving me the least. That's not how it works. You cannot go based off the of money. Okay. Also, there's sometimes greater client loyalty. It also avoids the conflict of loyalty as well. There is no vicarious liability because you're working together. When dealing with written notification of compensation to the broker and the fee arrangements, Texas law requires that the listing and buyer agency contracts don't have to actually be written. However, MLSs do. So it's not pursuant for a commission pursuant to subsection 1101.008 or 806. Fee splittings, however, between brokers must be in writing. If I'm going to split my commission with you, Aiden, who's another broker, it's got to be in writing. Okay. Again, we talked about procuring calls. I'm not going to spend time on that because we've already discussed that. But it basically, it's the effort that actually brings that desired result. And disputes over procuring calls is always a big one. I promise you, when you get your real estate license, you're going to run into it. I promise you, at least once in your life. It's generally a non-issue if the contract is actually in writing. Okay. You cannot do this, guys and gals. I'm going to be honest with you. You cannot do this. Aiden, you cannot say to Ms. Davenport, your client, Ms. Davenport, you just drive all over Houston and you just look at properties and you call the agents and all. When you find one, call me and I'll come out and look at it. Can't do that. You're not procuring calls. Even if you have a buyer's rep with Ms. Davenport, you're not procuring calls. Okay? That happens, by the way. A lot of Houston agents do that here. They'll tell their clients to come down to college station, drive around, call the agents, get all the information, then call them and they'll come and open up the place. Not acceptable. Okay, not going to work. When dealing with fee arrangements, this is the many different ways you can get paid. You can actually, if your broker allows, everything comes back to your broker, if your broker allows a retainer fee, there are some people that do this. Miss Lily, you come on into my office. I'll represent you. You put up $1,000 now. I represent you. And then I will charge a fee at the end for maybe $1,500 if you use me. But if you bag out on me or get me basically screwed out of the deal, I still got $1,000. There are some that also charge an hourly rate. They don't charge commission. They charge an hourly rate. You walk into the office, Enrique comes into my office, we say, he walks in, I say, okay, Enrique, what you need? I want to look at properties. Okay, Enrique, come on. Uh, by the way, I charge $250 an hour. Well, if I charge $250 an hour, how many houses do you think Enrique is going to end up wanting me to show him? One, one, <laughs> one property. Okay. You think I'm going to be showing 60 houses? No, and, and do you think Enrique is going to find the houses he really wants to see? Yeah, he's going to, he's going to hone those houses down because he don't want to pay me a lot. Versus commission-based, how much money do I make? I make 
three percent possibly, maybe up to six, but could also make zero percent if he decides to screw me. Yeah. Okay. So you could end up having a retainer fee where you charge a flat rate or you charge by the hour. You could do a seller paid fee, which happens most of the time. Or the A, the, if, like we said earlier, Mr. Eugene, you represent Ms. Davenport, she's giving out 6%, she's allowing 3% to go out, that's a seller paid fee. Commission split could be a split between me and Mr. Eugene. We may just come to a split. A buyer paid fee, like we said, could be an hourly rate, percentage fee, a flat fee, or a disclosure fee. Okay. There's also the net purchase price and the gross price. These are other ways that we could work things out. The buyer broker disclosures. These are the statutory written statements about the brokerage services. They're not a disclosure, but just simple information required to be provided. The disclosure of agency relationships must also be provided, as well as disclosure of advertising and property condition, as well as pricing opinions, title issues, and the status of a real estate licensee in a personal transaction. All of these are different requirements that must be disclosed by the broker. Okay, they're gonna be in offers. So what are our key points for this evening? Agents are gonna be more selective after we talked about this. It's very important that you as a real estate agent, you're selective, okay? You do not want to simply just accept any Tom, Dick, or Harry, okay? You want to end up in these situations, you need to choose who you're going to be with. I tell this to people all the time. Would you rather be honest with you? I want you to be truthful with me. Okay? You're a new agent. You're still trying to get yourself established. Would you rather have Enrique, who's looking for a $5 million house that's pre-approved, but he is extremely difficult and needy. Okay. <clears throat> or would you rather have Miss Leela, who just goes with the flow, and she ends up, she's looking for two one hundred thousand dollar transactions, and she just basically says, I trust you, you're the expert. Right now, Miss Leela. Why would you want Miss Leela? <laughs> Work. <laughs> Work. You know, it's nice to be wanted. Next week? Yeah. Say? She's appreciative. She's appreciative. Yeah. Okay. Why don't you want Mr. Mr. Enrique? Because I don't have a lot of expertise in the field, and if he's wanting a $5 million property, I'm going to have to know the ins and outs of everything. And a lot and, more. It's something that's it's way above my pay grade right now. And how much how much time is he going to use of, you, of yours? Oh, a lot. A lot. All of it. All of it, yeah. So you're not going to have any other client but Enrique. Yeah. And what's the potential of Enrique possibly screwing you out of the deal after three months? Pretty good. Pretty high. While with Miss Leela, the expertise, who's she relying on? On me. You. You're the expert. So you're probably going to be able to be a little more lax and not have to worry about Miss Leela taking every two seconds of your time calling you or texting you. Right? Yep. So in this situation, you want to be very selective. A lot of agents, when they get started, they hear $5 million. Heck yeah, I'll take Enrique's right now. But what's the problem with that? Do you, do, you want to get, do you want to get text messages from Enrique at 1 in the morning? Going, hey, where are we with that deal? Why is they responding? Why did the agent call us? Why doesn't the lender call me? Where's the text or where's the title company? Where's this at? Where's that? Who's this? When there? How why? When who what why? At one in the morning. No, I don't care. I wouldn't do it. Do you, okay, let's say this. I, you know what who I'm talking about. Uh, I know who you're talking about. Multiply that times ten. Okay, I'll pass. Uh-huh. <laughs> I've been there, by the way, guys. I've been there. <laughs> Done that. They okay. might even call you in the middle of the night and say, hey, I need to go back and revisit because I need to think about this room. Oh, yeah. And my wife wants to make sure that it's the size that she wants. Yeah. I've had people that called me before at 2 in the morning that called and said, hey, I was thinking about something. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's any way we might get somebody out there to redo the bathroom? 
before we close? Well, we close next week. Yeah, but do you think we can end up getting somebody to redo the bathroom before next week? I like the house, but I hate that corner, so let's look at 10 more. Yeah. Or, I don't like the carpet in this house. Let's go look at a brand new one. Okay? Yeah, that's what happens, guys and gals. You watch who you're with. You gotta, uh, I tell people this all the time. You gotta fake it to be around that person. You don't need them. I would rather deal with Miss Leela and she buy two $100,000 transactions than one client that's buying a $300,000 transaction. I don't want, I don't have time for a needy client. Don't have time for it. Okay? You gotta be selective. Maybe combined with seller representation in the same office sometimes not right for every buyer a representation is not right for every buyer everybody's different in writing is always better than oral we know that i can go and say hey cody you give me fifty dollars yeah man i'll give you fifty dollars tomorrow i say hey where's that fifty dollars what are you talking about you were talking to my twin you said you owed me fifty dollars <laughs> right uh-huh so again always in writing Avoid unintentional agency from in-house transaction. Always. You want to disclose the buyer agency to the listing agent at the initial contact. And also look for compensation from the buyers rather than sellers. If you have a buyer agency, you're getting paid by the buyer. Okay. Suggestions for brokers. Miss Linda. How to handle an offer received from a buyer's agent on one of your listings. Maybe you need an office policy there. Also, how are you going to advise sellers that such an offer may appear? Disclose or discuss with sellers the net effects of various types of offers. And the first question we have tonight is this. Mr. Keith, you with us tonight? Yes, sir. Hey, by the way, Miss Leela, Keith said the party's at his house tonight, so we're because we're halfway through. So just FYI, we're all going to Keith's after this. So oh, uh, yeah, come on over. I got you. <laughs> yeah, I'm on my way. Okay. <laughs> oh, <my God. laughs> so what factors, Mr. Keith, should an associate of a large multi-office consider when deciding to represent a buyer? What are some factors that an associate of a large multi-office consider when deciding to represent a buyer? What do you okay. Think? A large multi-office to represent a buyer. I would say... Um, Go for it. Okay, I would say... Uh, you should definitely consider uh, if uh, you're representing the buyer. So let's put it this way, Keith. You ready? I'll make it a little easier for you. Okay. All right. So say that you work with me. And say I have yeah. multiple offices throughout the whole state. Okay? Mm -hmm. And I have 500 agents under me. Okay. Now, if I'm a one-man show and I have 500 okay. agents underneath me, Mm -hmm. All of those listings are going to be in whose name, basically? In yours. In mine. So if Miss mm -hmm. Linda happened to come in and she's wanting to represent a buyer, what is something that we need to make certain that Miss Linda is aware of before she puts that buyer in a contract? Is there going to be potential showings? of listings of my own agents within my own firm? Yes. And is there a potential that there could be undue agency relationship? Definitely. Uh huh. So does yeah. Ms. Linda need to be aware of certain rules before she goes in and she ends up signing somebody up for a buyer? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes, sir. She does. Because Mr. Keith, you may have a listing that Miss Linda has a buyer for. 
and she's representing the buyer. Well, she, well, remember, she can't represent. Remember, it's all through me. But she gets a contract with the buyer in my name, and you have a listing with the seller. Well, now you just put me in intermediary relationship, and I think maybe your broker needs to be aware of that, don't you think? Yeah, I, I agree with you. Okay. So in these situations, there needs to be a certain breakdown in how we're basically representing people. Maybe it's just best for Miss Linda not to actually have a buyer rep, just have her buyer as a customer since we already have Keith under contract. Yeah. Or have that agent. You see what I'm saying there? Yes, sir. I like the way you broke that down. Perfect. Perfect. So let's move to the next one. Miss Linda. Oh, Lord. Answer this I one. Here. I'll let Miss Linda, I'll let Miss, I will let Miss Leela and Mr. Enrique help you on this question. That, y'all, y'all are going to have to help me on this, but my thinking is, is I would have, have to have a discussion with the owner about selling the property, telling them the, um, what's the word here I'm using, the um, things that I could help them if they would list with me with a broker. You're or, looking at it the wrong way. Okay. You're on track. You're on track. But if we were talking about sellers yesterday, that'd have been perfect. But in this situation, this is how you would want to handle that. Okay. If I walk up to Miss Leela and say, Miss Leela, I want to I want to list your property. And she says, I'm not listing with anybody. I'm doing it myself. The next thing you do, first off, what's that called? If she's representing herself, what's it called? Uh, for sale by owner. We call that a FISBO. Okay. So when Miss Leela says, I'm going to be a FISBO, then what I tell Miss Leela is say, okay, Miss Leela, can I ask you this favor? Can I come in and take photos and market the property to procure buyers and you allow me to show your house to these buyers, but you won't pay me. I'll do a buyer rep with them and the buyer pays me, not you. Are you okay with that? Now, what just happened? The debt is not on Miss Leela. Who's it on? It's on the buyer. It's on the buyer. So if the buyer wants to purchase the house, they got to pay the fee. Does that make sense? Okay. Mr. Eugene, you and Miss Davenport, I want y'all to answer this next one. Y'all work this one together. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Enrique, you go on and jump on over to number four and start thinking about that because I'm going to come to you. Waiting on you. What you got, Miss Gigi? Huh? Miss Linda, help him out. Who represents the buyer? 
Mr. Uh, Aiden, you got a listing? Yes, sir. Are you trying to find the buyer yourself? Um, It'd be nice, yeah. wouldn't it? Yeah. So in reality, are you going to find the buyer? No. Who's going to? Some other agent. Some other agent. So, do they want to get paid? Yep. If they want to get paid, then should there be certain rules on how payment works? Yeah, that's what the MLS rules is. So how do local MLS rules cover the situation for you, the listing agent, splitting fees with other agent? It's in the MLS. It's a, what the MLS stands for is what? Stephen, what's the MLS stand for? Multiple listing service. Multiple listing service. So it allows for a bunch of people to list into it, but all of those people that list into it are members. That makes sense. So every one of y'all would be a member of the MLS. But all of those people agree that whatever's in the MLS is how much you get paid. So if Stefan is, has a listing agent and you bring Mr. Eugene to the property and Stefan put 1% payment, you are accepting that 1% because you're already a member of the MLS. So it's like a club. You're joining in and you're agreeing to whatever the terms that are stated in the listing as your payment. So if there's, no, puts, there's no rule that of um, like percentage that you have to you have to do. That's what I, I, I yep. think there was a so not mean, a not a, one. not a requirement. Yeah. It doesn't say that Stefan has to give you six percent. It simply says that Stefan is giving you if you bring a buyer, he'll give you because the seller gave him right. He's giving you three percent, whatever it states, or whatever's in the listing contract. Okay, make sense? Yeah. Enrique, what's this one? Enrique went home and went to sleep. Oh, and didn't even invite didn't even invite anybody to go to sleep too. Enrique is no longer in the class. He's left. Yes. Okay. Well, Enrique has. Dropped out of the class tonight. <laughs> he said, I'm going home. <laughs> I don't blame him. I'm going too. So we're almost done. I want to just finish this one up. I'll finish these so we can call it a class. So, does Texas law require buyer broker agreements to be in writing? We saw that earlier. What did it say? No. Oral or written. Okay. Suppose the only fee involved is commission split with the listing broker. Does that have to be in writing? Yes. No to the first. Yes to the next one. When is the best time to discuss your agency status with the buyer? At the beginning. Okay, the very beginning. Because of the fact is it needs to be established. Right. How can procuring calls disputes arise in buyer agency situations? Well, we talked about that many times. Sometimes your clients are just driving around and see something and boom, they're interested, okay? Suppose the buyer views property at an open house, later talks to the listing agent at length, and then returns to the buyer agent to negotiate the offer. Guess what? That's a conflict. You need to be there with your client. Your client's looking, you better be there. Even if, Cody, you're supposed to go out to Hawaii and Miss Linda's buying a million dollar property, that may mean you got to reschedule your flight because she wants to go look at a house. You want to throw away $30,000 or you want to go on your trip to Hawaii? You going to go make some money, right? Okay. So that basically ends that for this evening. Mr. Stephan, go ahead real quick and stop our recording for tonight.